So welcome to uh, the Council on Foreign Relations uh, DC Fellows Book Launch Series. Uh, we're here to talk to Commissioner Kelly about his new memoir, Vigilance, My Life Serving America and Protecting Its Empire in the City. There's a big poster in the back. I have this one for you, too. And uh, welcome uh, to this event. We are going to talk a little bit about uh, local policing. We're going to talk about terrorism. My name is Dina Temple Raskin, and I'm the counterterrorism correspondent for National Public Radio, and I'm based in New York. So I've been covering uh, Commissioner Kelly for some time. And uh, his book is actually quite interesting because it starts at the beginning and takes you all the way through what's happened. It doesn't just look at the past, but it looks at the future. And it's perfectly timed for what it is we're dealing with now in terms of ISIS and terrorism, and also with just community policing and some of the events that's hap that have happened in police, uh, you know, street crime and policing in recent months. And some of these things are actually addressed in the book, and we'll address them tonight as well. Um, so please join me in welcoming uh, Commissioner Ray Kelly. <laughs> Now, I have to admit, I'm a bit of a terrorism geek. So for me, the terrorism stuff in the book was particularly interesting, particularly because I, I lived it as, as someone who was there in New York City. And among the things you do in the book is you outline 16 specific terrorist uh, plots that were foiled during your 12 years as, as police commissioner. Um, and, I, and I knew the details of every one of them, but I'm very interested to know, for you, which one was the closest call? I'll just let me start off by thanking uh, Richard Haas, thanking the council, thank you, Dexter, for having me here today. We had a similar event at the council last week in, uh, in Manhattan, and uh, uh, I am a distinguished visiting fellow, and it's really quite an honor to be associated with this, uh, this organization. So which terrorist event of the 16 came closest? Well, one actually took place in a very diluted form, and that is Faisal Shahzad. On May 1st of 2010, he drives right into Times Square, finds a parking spot, and uh, he's going to blow up the car that he, he is in with propane tanks. Now, let me go back to how this started. Faisal Shahzad was is a naturalized U.S. citizen, Pakistani origin. Goes to Pakistan, like so many of the uh, people who uh, become uh, radicalized. He, his major motivator was Abu Ghraib and you know atrocities, alleged atrocities. Thrones as well, yeah. right? He goes there. He he hooks up with the uh, Pakistani Taliban. They give him a formula as to how to put together a, a bomb. He comes back, and the formula consists of uh, fertilizer, M80 firecrackers and uh, propane tanks. He starts to accumulate this material, and he feels that people are going to identify him, or they're going to suspect him, because he looks like he's Pakistan. So he goes to uh, Pennsylvania to buy firecrackers, but he buys M88 firecrackers. He thumbs it down. The same thing with the, with the fertilizer. He buys one of less uh, toxicity, if you will. He, he, he purchases a, a vehicle in, uh, in Connecticut. He's gonna, he drives in, it's right next to the Marriott Hotel, and he sets it off. He explodes, uh, try, tries to explode, but just smoke comes out from the fuse that he had. There were vendors there, they saw him, they called the police. There was a police officer on a horseback, he goes over. They didn't arrest him, he got away. Ultimately, he's arrested two days later on a flight to Abu Dhabi. Uh, that hadn't left the airport, Kennedy Airport, so it was very close to him getting away. By the way, he had an M9 rifle in his car. He was going to shoot it out. <clears throat> of course, he left the car in, in the parking lot. We didn't know anything about Faisal Shahzad, the total uh, zero as far as being on, on the radar screen. So that was, was, was the closest. Um, the uh, Najibul Azazi has gotten a lot of... Uh, uh, Press, but that was 2009, the year before, where he and two companions were going to blow themselves up on the subway uh, when uh, President Obama was in town, September 14th of 2009. But through an NSA intercept, his uh, preparation of the the bomb uh, was identified. He was followed from Colorado with 
you know, he I, don't, I don't want to keep... He could actually build a bomb, uh, I'm right? Sorry? Isn't that the big difference, that Zazi could actually build a bomb, whereas clearly Faisal Shahzad um, wasn't a great bomb maker? No, but, I, I, but he did it intentionally. By the way, he, he confesses all of this. This is right. all, you know, he's proud of what he did, Faisal Shahzad, and he tells the whole, the whole story, and he tells about how he, how he tried to, uh, you know, reduce the, um, his, his profile, if you will. And, and uh, the thing I remember about the Faisal Shahzad story was that, um, so I don't know if it was NYPD or FBI actually go on the plane and pull him off the plane. And does he actually, is this a hypocritical story or not? Does he actually say, I think you're looking for me? Or is that a hypocritical yeah. story? No, I, I, think, I think U.S. Customs, I was the commissioner of years ago, I want to get, get everybody into the act. I think they were involved in, in that uh, as well. <clears throat> but he did somehow identify himself. So um, those of us who track terrorism, I think, and even just regular uh, citizens who see plot after plot come out in the news, I think to most of us, we're kind of surprised that nothing has happened since 9-11, even though we have these close yeah. calls that you've talked about. Is that because our counterterrorism measures are that good, or is it because these guys who try to do it are a bit feckless? I think it's a big unknown. Uh, sure, we're going to claim uh, the credit for it, you know. <clears throat> but Take New York, for instance, 10 million people during the workday at open, an open city. Uh, obviously, we know all of the, 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 the tweets, that type of communication going up from ISIS and, and others, 90,000 a day, uh, we're told. So very difficult to get your arms around it. We know radicalization. Another case that's mentioned in the book, Jose Pimentel, radicalized basically on his own uh, uh, computer screen. That's what gets him to do the things that he was going to do, which was he was going to uh, blow up soldiers returning from, uh, from uh, Afghanistan. So, uh, you know, we, we've been lucky. I think we've been good. And uh, we're going to have to be that way for, in my view, a long time to come. Why hasn't there been more attacks? We saw the, the attack uh, against the Westgate Mall in, in Nairobi. Uh, it was done with four people. And maybe as many as 100 people were killed. And there was a lot of... Um, uh, certainly ineptitude on the part of the uh, police and the military that responded there. But it's so simple to do. The individual on the train in, in France. I don't have a good answer for you, but yeah, I think federal government's doing a good job. I think state and local police are certainly involved, but uh, it, it's so simple to do some of these things that you have to ask the question, why not? Well, in the past, uh, when you compare, say, al-Qaeda with ISIS, in the past, people who were radicalized for al-Qaeda would travel. As you said, Faisal Shahzad went to Pakistan, even though that was TTP. But as a general matter, Zazi traveled as well. Um, and these ISIS people don't necessarily need to travel, which makes it much harder to find them. Can you compare the ISIS threat as we see it now and uh, the al-Qaeda threat that uh, you'd been fighting for 12 years? Yeah, well, uh, as we said before, I think it's a distinction without a difference as far as we're concerned. They want to kill us. They want to come here and kill Americans or overseas. So, uh, uh, you know, I don't know about how much we need to parse it, but I, I think you, you do have a point that ISIS uh, and the people going, joining ISIS are joining an army. That, you know, it's a de facto standing army. Al-Qaeda is much more... Uh, circumspect, circumspect, much more clandestine in in their their operations and their approach to doing uh, doing business. Uh, ISIS, if you you know, Dabiq is a city in Syria that uh, in the in the Haditha, which uh, you know, it's Muhammad musings, uh, a huge battle is supposed to take there, basically between good and and evil, good being. The Muslims and and, and others. evil being yeah. So the they 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 want to uh, have that battle, and their um, website, their magazine, is called Dabik, <laughs> because so their whole approach is yeah. Here I am. Here we are. Come on, uh, let's you know let's engage uh, that sort of thing. Obviously, that's not uh, Al Qaeda's approach, but for us, you know, we're, we're threatened by both groups. Right. So. One of the things that you've talked a little bit about and certainly has been in the news is this idea of accepting refugees from Syria and, and those areas here in the United States. And one of the reasons why people say they don't want them to come here 
is because uh, there's a concern that jihadis will hide themselves within this population. Is that something you worry about from a terrorism perspective? Mm, I, not particularly. I think, uh, you know, the more immediate worry is people who are being radicalized on the, uh, you know, on, on the internet or just sitting in their basement here in this country. I think accepting refugees is something that we do. We're all refugees and, uh, or, you know, descendants of refugees in a, in a way. I think that's what America is all about. Do I think they should be vetted? Yes. Is it challenging? Yes. But I can tell you, even in the New York City Police Department, if you want to vet somebody who was born outside the country to hire, and now there are police officers born in 106 countries in the NYPD. No other police department in the world comes close to that. But if you want to vet somebody who was born in Pakistan, very difficult to do. So it, it, it's, it's simply not easy. I think we should do it. I was happy to see that the, that the president or secretary of state indicated that we're going to go up to 100,000 uh, refugees in, in, in two years' time. <clears throat> so let's talk a little bit about street crime. Uh, you and Bill Bratton, the, the current commissioner of the NYPD, have sparred a bit over the idea of uh, stop, question, and frisk. Uh, there was just an article in the past couple of weeks in The New Yorker about uh, Commissioner Bratton and how he felt about uh, that practice. Do you think that stop, question, and frisk was overused in New York? And if you had to do it again, would you have, would you use it more judiciously? Uh, <laughs> I would use it the way we used it. I think Bill Bratton is a top flight professional. Interestingly, when he was Los Angeles chief, it was used more per police officer there uh, than it was in, uh, in New York. So he has uh, apparently uh, changed his thinking, although he hasn't hasn't said that. And uh, you have to also norm for population. <clears throat> the population of Los Angeles is about 40% of what uh, New York City is. And some indications, car stops and pedestrian stops were uh, like 800,000. If you norm, it puts it up to like 2 million. And we know that people live in their cars in, in, in Los Angeles. So these numbers are, get very, very, uh, uh, you know, murky. Now, what is it? It is a practice that stems from the common law. It's what you pay your constable, your police officer, to do to intervene when there's suspicious activity. This practice was validated by the Supreme Court decision, Terry versus Ohio. It's codified. It's on the books in every, every state in the, uh, in the union. Now, uh, do I think it's a panacea, the be-all and end-all? No, I don't. But it is an integral tool that police officers need to have. Now, just to put it, I hate to go, keep going to numbers here, but New York City has a population of 8.4 million people, as I said before, go up to 10 million a day. We have 35,000 uniformed police officers. Let's say 19,000 of them are in position to stop and question someone. And less than half the people stop are patted down. 19,000, uh, they work about 190 patrol tours a year. That's about 3, 3.6 million. If you add seven hours, you multiply seven hours, 25 million patrol hours a year. They, they, this administration says that 40,000 stops in that situation in, in New York City is the appropriate number. Mm -hmm. 40,000 out of those hours. And, and also, several hundred thousand calls go to the 911 system every year about suspicious activity. Right. So it, it, it is not being utilized the way I think it should be utilized. Is it, is it uh, number driven? Uh, no, it's event driven. But certainly, there are a lot more events that are happening in, in New York City than, there are, than uh, that would indicate. In the 12 years of the Bloomberg administration, there were 9,500 fewer murders than the 12 years before uh, Michael Bloomberg. Those lives that are saved, uh, in, in my judgment, as history as any guide, are the lives of young men of color, because that's who's getting killed on the streets of this city and New York City and other, other major cities. So it is an important tool. It was not overutilized. I can tell you, when I was a police officer, we didn't record it. In many cities, it's just simply not recorded. The stop rate 
in New York was significantly lower than what it was in Baltimore, in Philadelphia, in Chicago, and in LA in, in the example that I told you. So no, we, and, and to a certain extent, are being punished for, just for better record keeping. So um, you talk about this a little bit in the book, and, uh, and I don't want to belabor the point. But uh, can you talk a little bit about the court ruling? I mean, there was a second, am I right? Is it Second Circuit court ruling yeah. that actually well, found stopped? You have to go back and you, uh, this litigation started in 1999. It's the, the plaintiffs, for all intents and purposes, of the Center for Constitutional Rights. And, you know, the, the actual plaintiffs themselves are fungible, but they're the attorneys for the, uh, for the plaintiffs. So it goes in front of Judge Shinlin in 1999. There is an agreement, uh, the, the case is, uh, it has a, it, the city agrees to do certain things. The case is ended, Sen Senate for uh, uh, Constitutional Rights starts another litigation the, nec uh, the next day. It also goes in, in front of Judge Schindler, which was, uh, in, in my judgment, judgment of a lot of other people, and, and including the, uh, the Second Circuit, inappropriate. It should be done on a sort of a random wheel. Anyway, there was a trial. It was uh, uh, strangely uh, coinciding with the mayoral uh, election. And uh, the case- The most recent mayoral election. Most mayoral election, election uh, in 2013. The, uh, the judge finds that something called indirect racial profiling is, is taking place. That term has never been used uh, before. In the trial, there was, a, there was an expert for the plaintiffs. Uh, he looks at four million stops over a decade. He says that 6% of those four million stops uh, don't meet constitutional muster. 6%, uh, 94% do. In the trial itself, in terms of the plaintiffs, there are 19 stops in question. The judge finds that 10 of the 19 stops are constitutionally acceptable. Even so, the finding is that of this indirect racial, racial profile, I just mentioned to you how diverse the, the department is. So it, somehow a policy that was fostered by you know, the, the uh, executive core was, was forced on the most diverse police department in, in the world to conduct something called indirect racial profile. So what happens is Mayor Bloomberg uh, appeals the case. It, go, uh, it goes to the Second Circuit. Before the case is appealed, they remove the judge from the case. This is after her decision. She's removed from any further activity with that case because of pretrial partiality. This is the same body that's going to hear the appeal. Right. Uh, Mayor de Blasio takes office. He decides not to go forward with the appeal. So he would have to have a monitor. Uh, put in place. So this is so what, that's where we are now. This is one of the reasons why it's controversial because it's seen yeah. as as having been ruled against it. Let me because uh, we don't. I want to get to questions. I want to ask you a little bit about the Eric Garner case. And just for people, I'm pretty sure you know which one it is. But this is the one that happened in New York in Staten Island. Is, yes. is that right? In which uh, a police officer actually used chokehold. He said he couldn't breathe, and uh, he ended up dying. Um, if you had been there in New York at that time as commissioner, how would you have handled it differently? And um, what do you think should happen going forward? Well, first of all, the case is still going on. There's been no action taken against the officer involved. In it. So to, in, in the NYPD, all disciplinary uh, activity above a certain level goes to the police commissioner. And that's where the final determination is made. So I am not going to. Uh, say what, you know, what the decision should be. What I said and say in the book is that I would have appreciated the grand jury minutes being made public because I, I, I wonder, I don't know, if what we call a frame, now it changes a little bit with the technology out there, but did the jury look at every frame? I, I don't know that. What's the commentary? Every frame of the video. Every frame, of, because that video was stopped. Right. If you look at the publicly available video, you can see it's, it, there are breaks in it. So I would have liked to have known that, to look at the grand jury minutes and see what, uh, what the district attorney uh, said uh, during that. Um, I'm the person who uh, put in a regulation about uh, uh, chokeholds. I did it when the first time I was, uh, I was commissioner. 
Uh, but against them. Uh, against them. But I don't know the circumstance. I don't know how long. You know, these types of questions. How long was the, you know, uh, Eric Garner uh, held? Uh, it, those things you'd have to find out. I think from a really in-depth analysis of that of that tape. Right. So as you know, there there are issues right now between uh, police and local communities. One was made, uh, just happened in New York recently, in which the U.S. tennis star um, Blake was, uh, James Blake, was tackled by uh, yeah. police. Should that officer have been arrested? No, no, not at all. He's performing a, a what he considers to be a, you know, certainly a lawful exercise of his power. Now, what I've said is if you just look at that video itself, and if you this know what the alleged the crime hotel. was, I'm sorry? This is security video from the hotel. Yeah. yeah, so the crime is a credit card fraud. The video shows one officer grabbing him and, and pushing him down. Um, that is the type of arrest where you go up and introduce yourself to the individual. And there were other police officers on the team. Now there's information coming out that they were doing something else and they might have been afraid of this individual running. But if you just look at the four corners, his arrest um, approach was inappropriate. That's not, uh, not what you do. Is there extenuating circumstances? I don't know. Uh, we're gonna we're gonna hear now. There is a whole disciplinary proceeding in the police process in the police department where you have a courtroom, where you have judges who are lawyers, where you have advocates who are lawyers, who are you know. Who, uh, presenting this case, the defense attorneys that are involved. All of that has to go forward. It has not happened, to, and I don't know if it is going to happen to the officer in, in Staten Island, right. but police officers are entitled to due process, and, and that's what the, the officer involved in the Blake case uh, should receive. Okay. So at this time, I'd like to invite uh, people from the audience to ask uh, Commissioner Kelly some questions. Uh, I need to remind you that this is, in fact, on the record. Please wait for the microphone and speak directly into it. And uh, Stan, state your name. And uh, please actually ask a question. <laughs> this gentleman in the second row, please. Thank you. Um, Commissioner, um, one of the things that's unique about NYPD is its capabilities internationally. It has a very robust capability in terms of relationships with other law enforcement agencies and its own intelligence apparatus. Um, and there's unique reasons for that, but I'd be interested if you could describe why that works for NYPD, how that might apply to other law enforcement agencies, and how that interrelates with national apparatus for those purposes. Well, an important reason for establishing those overseas uh, posts was uh, that David Cohn became our Deputy Commissioner of Intelligence. David, some members of David's family are here uh, tonight. He was absolutely terrific. Now, I was the custom Commissioner I mentioned, so David and I, and Customs had legats, legal attaches uh, overseas when I was there. And, and so David and I had this conversation, hey, why don't we do that? And why, what, what is the rationale behind it? Well. We looked at some cases early on, and some of the threats had to do with multiple cities, and the question was if something surfaced in some other city in Europe or whatever, would they tell us? They're concerned about their own safety, and, and is there any way of us getting information, little bits of information that will help us better protect New York? And we said yes. Now, I didn't want to fund it through the regular tax levy budget because Somebody gets their car broken into in, you know, in Queens and, it's, hey, you got a cop in Abu Dhabi and my car is, uh, window was broken into. So we used the police foundation, asked the police foundation, you should say, to fund it. And it cost just a little over a million dollars a year. And you know what that is in this city. when you start, <laughs> It's really pocket change. So uh, we decided to go to locations, and David had terrific contacts that helped in this regard, that were hospitable to uh, having a police officer there and, and that would provide potentially some information to better protect uh, New York. Now, what's unique about it is that they're embedded with local police. They're not working with the ambassador, the U.S. ambassador. It's not like the legats that the FBI and 
U.S. Customs have. They are actually cop to cop, which is a sort of a unique bonding. So where are they now? They're in, and it also highlights the diversity of the department. We had a, uh, a lieutenant and his wife. He's born in Egypt. He's he, a lieutenant, as I say. She was born in Egypt, a police officer assigned to Abu Dhabi. Obviously, they speak you know, Arabic. They happen to be Coptic Christians. Similarly structured with people who are appropriate for where they, where they went. We, had, um, uh, we have now, the department has uh, officers in well, Lyon, France, which is where Interpol is located, uh, Amman, Jordan, uh, Tel Aviv. And we have, the, the, for instance, the detective who was there in Tel Aviv was a member of the Israeli Defense Force. Um, in uh, Madrid, Spain, an officer there was born in, uh, in Madrid, in Paris. Um, and we've rotated people in and out, but uh, we have people who at one time were you know, born in, uh, in Paris. In the UK, in um, Montreal, in Toronto, in Singapore, and Dominican Republic. They're there, they have the ear to the ground, they act as a tripwire listening post to help better protect New York. Secondarily, they're also in a position to go to terrorist events and find information out as quickly as possible. Example, Mumbai, 2008. Uh, we had three of our liaisons go there and got there just after the shooting stopped. We wanted to get as much information as we could as quickly as we could. Why? Mumbai, obviously, financial capital of uh, that area of the world. It started out as a hostage-taking situation. So something like that could happen in, uh, in uh, New York. In less than one week's time, we had 400 people in our auditorium, security directors, with those three officers on a, on a, a live hookup from Mumbai. They produced a 75-page report that we gave to the FBI uh, that morning. I had a tabletop exercise with our commanders, roughly replicating what happened. And we had an actual exercise of Floyd Bennett Field that, was on, uh, that we were watching on, on television. This is all in less than a week. Um, we put those people overseas, I did, uh, to a large extent to get real-time, rapid information. And, and that's what we got here. A couple of things we learned or did as a result of that. We're concerned about a protracted terrorist uh, hostage-taking situation. So we had about 400 people in NYPD who are qualified with heavy weapons, emergency service unit. We augmented them with 20, uh, 250 uh, people from our Organized Crime Control Bureau who trained with heavy weapons and were, go were the backups. They did their regular jobs, but they were to act as backups. We also filmed the interior of the major hotels in, uh, uh, in Manhattan and used it to teach police officers. Uh, they're not in the hotels, hotels every day. Where is the power room? Where's the, where's the TV monitor? You want to go and see what's, you know, what you can uh, watch as far as what's going on in location. So we learned a lot. Uh, I, I think it's well worth the, the money, and it comes from, from the, uh, the private sector. But the, the goal was to put something in place that helps us better protect New York City, and I think it has. And, and it changed your attitude, too, about these kinds of situations, right? Before, you used to think about hostage negotiation, and now it's much more, you know that the idea here is not for a negotiation for hostage, but to kill as many people as possible. Yeah, Can you well, talk I mean, you still have that? to have that capacity out there to, uh, to negotiate in the department. There's a captain that I worked with many years ago, Frank Bowles, who really initiated a lot of that. Uh, he put it in place. Uh, after the Munich uh, 1972, whenever it was, uh, he, he put that in place. And the, the, the department prides itself on the, on the hostage negotiation regimen that it has in place. And, and during the Charlie Hebdo attacks, I know you had a New York uh, police officer who was there in Paris. And I know he was incredibly helpful to the French who didn't know exactly what was unfolding because it f unfolded after so many days. Uh, and I know that... Uh, he was very key in what they were doing there. Yeah, well, it's a big organization. You have 54,000 employees, and <clears throat> so they could be anywhere. <laughs> mm -hmm. uh, yes, sir. In the uh, third row, the gentleman in the blue blazer. Thanks. Uh, Commissioner, could you talk a little bit? Could you bit? introduce yourself? I'm oh, sorry. I'm sorry. Shelby Coffey from the Museum. 
Um, Commissioner, I'm wondering if you could talk a little bit about the future effects and the effects we're seeing now in the use of uh, cell phones, smartphones, to film encounters between the public and the police and their use on 24-hour news. There's talk, as I'm sure you've heard, about uh, is there a war on police? Is there, is there a police war on parts of the public? And one of the factors that people talk about is the, the effect of these videos and the use of social media in, uh, in broadcasting these incidents. Are we in for a new era, and how do you see that unfolding? You, you, so you're saying the cell phone cameras. In other words, yes, the fact the that pe people are recording a, a, a police officer interaction. Yes. Uh, yeah, I think it, uh, it's a game changer. And uh, that's why I support, one of the reasons why I support police officers wearing cameras. I wasn't always totally supportive of it because I, uh, I thought, and I still think, that police officers wearing cameras will cause them to hesitate. Uh, in some people's minds, that's a good thing. In some people's minds, that's a bad thing. But I think we're going to see hesitation. But if you look at the video, the horrendous uh, incident in North Charleston, South Carolina, where Walter Scott is shot in the back, and it appears that the officer is planting evidence uh, on him. I've, no, no rational uh, officer wearing a camera would have acted like that, in my judgment. So This is the man who was running across the field. That's the one you're talking he, about. He runs out of his car. It was a traffic violation. He's wearing a green shirt, and the police officer looks in a rather casual manner, shoots him in the back. Um, I think these cameras, I think like the train has left the station as far as wearing cameras are concerned. They're expensive. Where do you store all of this information? How long do you store it? Who has access to it? These are all very important questions that have to be worked out. But I think the concept is, is with us uh, to stay. And I believe that these cameras will show much more uh, positive, heroic, life-saving work on the part of the police than the inappropriate uh, uh, conduct. Uh, I, I think uh, what you see with a lot of videos that are filmed by the public, they start in the middle of the, of the incident. You don't see why it, why it happened. You don't see what happened initially. And you'll see the police. There's no, there's no Marcus or Queensbury rules. Arresting someone is not an easy thing to do, particularly if they don't want to be arrested. So you know it's not a pretty sight that sometimes. So you see that that sort of thing, and you know people get uh, shocked by it. But it's uh, I think what the cameras will do is to at least give the potential for a beginning, a middle, and an end uh, uh, as far as filming an incident is concerned. Gentleman in the second row, please. Hi, Chief. Uh, Dan Kanuski. I'm a Homeland Security okay. researcher. Uh, in my field, 9-11 was a seminal event, and obviously you know better than anybody the effect that 9-11 had. What I've looked at is Homeland Security funding, and Homeland Security funding obviously dramatically increased after 9-11, and it helped build the capabilities of federal, state, and local police departments for a counterterrorism mission. What I worry about today, though, is crime. I see crime uh, rates increasing in major <laughs> metropolitan areas, including New York City, and there's no uh, galvanizing event for it, our citizens of these cities to say, crime is out of control. We need to empower the police department either through tactics or uh, provide additional resources to prevent crime from coming out of, uh, spiraling out of control. So my question is, where or how or when will that 9-11 type event happen? <clears throat> In the, in the area of crime prevention to enable police officers around this country to execute their crime-fighting mission instead of their counterterrorism mission? Well, uh, I think, uh, if you put it sort of in a historical perspective, crime is down dramatically for the last two decades. I, in the country, I'm talking about, I attribute that, generally speaking, to smarter policing, to use of, of technology. The cops have done a very good job Part of America, in, in my judgment. Now we see the, uh, and, and crime is still down quite a bit. So I, I, I don't have the same concerns that you have at this juncture, but could it happen down the road? Yeah. Uh, I think we have to be careful about it. 
what you see is the events of uh, Ferguson. You see the events of uh, North Charleston. You see these other other events that have happened. You see what happened in New York with the, the whole stop question and, and first approach. The signals that have been given to police officers to back off, to <coughs> hesitate. And some people call it the Ferguson effect, although there's more than Ferguson uh, involved. And I think that's a, a problem. But uh, the, as, it'll take some time. But I think the, even cameras will, have a, will, will play a role in sort of increasing the uh, public's trust in, in certain communities of color where it's questionable sometimes as to just how well the police and the communities get along. I, I think over time that will that will make a difference. But right now, the New York Times had an article two weeks ago, and front page where it said murder is up in 30 cities throughout America. Well, that's just not a coincidence. It's up because of uh, I think the sort of collective. We live in a much smaller world these days, so the cops are seeing what's going on in other places and they're receiving the, you know, the signals. But don't forget, we're talking about civil servants. We're talking about people who are going to get paid, you know, sort of irrespective of what their actions are, as long as they're not against the regulations or they're not they're illegal. So it's kind of a natural uh, pulling back. And I think that is the more reason, a, a, a significant reason, maybe not the only reason, but that's why you see the increased levels of, uh, of crime. So the issue is, is that going to turn around or level off, what have you. I think it's going to take some time. And I think the adoption of cameras will, will, will play a role in that. There's some kind of equilibrium that, that you know, will be, will be reached. But uh, I know there's concern. There's a concern in, in uh, a lot of cities. And, uh, you know, we'll have to wait and see. One of the points you make in the book is that you think that police officers should have a college degree now. Well, why is that? Well, I think the job of police officer law enforcement has become much more complex, much more demanding. I mean, we want, uh, want them to be uh, technologically uh, savvy. Uh, we require a college degree for virtually every teacher in America, in, you know, out in the most uh, uh, rural areas that teach as a college degree. Yet we give tremendous power to a police officer, a life and death, literally life and death uh, power. You know, you have to understand uh, Supreme Court decisions, you know, constitutional law. This is a average police officer riding in a, in a police car. So to not require a, the same uh, qualification that you require from a teacher, I think, is, uh, is not wise. And I, I think it will change the, the recruitment pool you know, I, I'm, I'd like to see, there'll be ways, let's assume this goes forward. Very few departments require this. NYPD requires 60, 60 college credits. But if that requirement went in, there'll be ways of somehow getting a college degree just based on life experience or whatever. We've had that, that in the past. Uh, you know, that, that's probably going to be an outgrowth of this, this movement. But uh, I think genuine four-year college, you know, matriculating, baccalaureate getting uh, uh, system would, uh, would help uh, police do their job because of the complexity of our world. Gentlemen on this side, on the third row, please, the red tie. Well, uh, Tim Petri, uh, you, I don't know if you have, did you have any views on whether the huge increase in uh, incarceration has has played a role in the diminution of crime, or if there's an easier, or better way of controlling crime than putting people away for as long as we have been. Yeah, I mean there was this belief, and I guess the fact that years ago that uh, that uh, a, a lot of people in prison were there because of drug uh, violations, low level or there was a uh, you know unequal uh, sentencing as far as uh, crack cocaine so that, that sort of thing. I think to a large extent that issue is being addressed. I think more and more what you see in prison now are people there for violent crimes, 
they're not there for drug offenses for the most part. And as you go forward, as we go forward, that is, is that problem is being addressed more uh, and more and more. I mean, I've read the things, the million dollar block and uh, those types of things. I think it's a real problem, uh, but I'm not certain if the solution is to sort of open the, uh, you know, open the gates of the, uh, of the prison. I think as a general proposition, I think focusing on violent crime and, and separating people from society for violent crime is, is the way to go and, and not for uh, drugs for the most part. I mean, drug, it's more complicated than that, but I mean, I, 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 that's the approach that uh, I think is, uh, is a sound one. So one last question there in the back, and then uh, you can speak with the commissioner yourselves and get his book in the back. Hi, my name is Mike Reddick with the Brookings Institution, and I apologize for not having all the facts about this, but I, I recall hearing a This American Life or something about a Richmond yeah, policing, yes. policing <laughs> program um, where they targeted, I, I want to say, 17 individuals who were responsible for something like 90%, and these are just notional numbers of the firearms violations. <laughs> And that's not a tradition, and they gave them cash and worked with them in a social work type of way. And that's not a traditional law enforcement mechanism, but I was wondering, as you see law enforcement evolving, what role, if any, will that play with traditional law enforcement? Okay, if not you, it's me. I'm a disabled veteran. So I didn't hear the whole a part of the question, but basically it is identification of an individual who's done something wrong and pay the money no? No. It was, it was actually, I, I had trouble following it a little bit. Sorry. So I believe in the city of Richmond, oh, Richmond. Okay. they identified something like a very small number of individuals who are responsible for the vast majority of firearms violations. Right. And instead of arresting them and having them go in and out of prisons and, and continue to offend, they ended up working with them more in a social work way giving them cash and trying to get them jobs. And having them turn in their guns, right? Ex of course, that, yeah. as well. Yeah, sort of but it was, important point. yeah. yeah. Th this is a concept that's been around since the 90s. Uh, <coughs> there's lots of unanswered questions about it. What is the recidivist rate? What happens if you have organizations that sponsor this sort of thing? Here's the general construct. We take pictures of some group doing bad drugs. We'll say they're selling drugs, okay? And then we call them in and we say, hey, look at these pictures. If you continue to do this, we're gonna, we're gonna lock you up. And oh, by the way, here's some, other, here's some benefits and things that we'll give you, put you on a, on a straight and narrow. Now, groups that do this have um, uh, bragged about it, that it's working all over. And I'm talking about well, 25 years this has been out there. There's been no meaningful study, uh, certainly not by the federal government, as to whether or not this, this uh, is effective. And as I say, what is the recidivism uh, rate? You know, groups will claim, you know, success, and somebody will throw uh, money at them, and then other groups will, will do it. There's, you know, there's ceasefire and other programs in, in cities that have, just are not evaluated. And I think there's lots of unanswered questions in, uh, in these programs. Now, well, I had some money in New York, and what I did was, and I, quite frankly, I think it's ongoing now, but we wanted to do a program like this in Brownsville. But I insisted on having a objective evaluation component to, to take a look at it, as, as opposed to having self-serving statements on the part of the groups who were, who were in, this, in this business. So, and how did to that the best work of mine, I'm sorry? And how did that work out? It hasn't been, I, I think it's still going, it was like a three-year study. Uh, I, I don't know, but it's the first time that I can recall that, the, you know, that, hey, here's at least the, the possibility of having an objective analysis of this, because they claim credit all the time, or they'll claim credit for a two-block area, you know, which is not that difficult to do. You put police cars and, you know, surround that area, you know, <laughs> what, 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 what is the, you know, what is the spillover effect? All of those, all of those things, I think, or many, many of the questions uh, would ideally be answered in some sort of evaluation I'm talking about. Excellent. Well, thank you very much for the uh, thank you. terrific conversation. Thank you. Thank you.